Good evening everyone and a very warm welcome to the Nottingham Astronomical Society's June meeting. Tonight's lecture is given by Professor Ian Morrison from the University of Manchester and his talk this evening will be on wonders of the southern sky. Before we begin, just a quick update on our online meeting schedule. We've now two further meetings planned online. So our next meeting is in a fortnight's time on Thursday the 18th of June and that meeting will be on capturing and processing deep sky images by two of our members, Gareth and Lee. Our lecture for July is scheduled for Thursday the 2nd of July at 8pm again online and this will be presented by Dr Richard McKim from the British Astronomical Association. Richard is the Mars Section Director at the BAA and his talk will be on Mars in 2020 as we have a very favourable apparition of the planet coming up later this year. So on with this evening's meeting. Tonight we're delighted to welcome back a regular visitor to our society, Professor Ian Morrison. Ian's from the University of Manchester and is also the 35th Gresham Professor of Astronomy. In his academic career, he designed the 217-kilometre Merlin Array, which is the equivalent radio resolution as the Hubble Space Telescope has in the optical. Over the years, he has been in heavily involved with science at Jodrell Bank and was the project scientist for attempts to receive signals back from the Beagle 2 lander on Mars. Ian teaches astronomy courses at Manchester University's School of Physics and Astronomy, and he's also patron of Macclesfield Astronomical Society, which he helped establish in 1990. So hopefully now Ian can join us on Zoom to introduce his lecture. Wonders of the Southern Sky. It's obviously a bit hype. I don't really like hype press releases and things, what this really should be titled is the following. Objects in the southern sky that you might find a bit interesting. So it's a potpourri of things that I find interesting in the southern sky and actually one thing on the ground in the southern hemisphere. And there's a fair bit, a little bit of my own astro imaging in it, just to help point out where some of these objects are. So let's begin. It's partly illustrated with some of my wide field pictures of Milky Way, taken obviously from the Southern Hemisphere. But you can obviously do that in the Northern Hemisphere, you need somewhere pretty dark. And one place I've been to um, is in fact the Skellig Star Party, which is held in August in the southwest of Ireland. And it is one of the four gold tier, maybe five now, gold tier dark sky reserves. So one of the darkest places in the Earth. And of course, you're looking right out into the Atlantic. And essentially, it's down here. It overlooks what are called the Skelligs, a couple of rather nice islands. Skellig St. Michael was actually used, and some of you may have seen, in the Star Wars film, The Force Awakens, and it may also have been in The Jedi Returns. I think they filmed two sections there. So that's where I was. In fact, just on their mainland, about where my arrow is there. I was using my Nikon D610 full frame camera with a Tamron 24 millimeter lens, so quite wide angle, on an AstroTrack that some of you may know of. Basically, it means you basically carry on pointing to the same region of the sky during the period of the exposures. And as I was taking my first set of images to stack, and I was going to make a vertical panorama, someone came up to me and said, is your picture green? So I then looked at it and said, oh, yes, it is. I said, that's good because we're using Canon cameras and yours is an icon. It can't be the sensor. And what we had been imaging and capturing, and for the first time I've ever seen, is what is called air glow. It's a type, really, of aurora. And here it's visible from the space station. Ultraviolet light in the daytime can excite the oxygen atoms. And at night, they can give out that O3 line, which is the same green color that you get with another type of aurora, obviously the aurora borealis. So I'd never seen it before. I suspect you've got to be in a very dark location to see it because it's very faint. It did take some effort to remove, but I did manage to get this vertical panorama uh, coming out of the hills nearby. Um, up over here, if you can see that, it's Vega in Lyra. Up here is Deneb, 
and not far, there's Deneb, but not far is the North American Nebula, and down here, a rather sweet little constellation, Delphinus the Dolphin. Anyway, most of this is about any observing and imaging I've done from New Zealand, because some 12 years ago, my son married a Kiwi, that's a young lady from New Zealand, and they emigrated, and so I've been visiting there quite a bit. It also happens that for a long time, I've been a friend of the superintendent of the Mount John Observatory in New Zealand, and I've stayed with him on the mountaintop a couple of times, and now, in fact, he's retired, so I stay with him in his house also uh, very close. So we'll see the result. And here you can actually see where this Haraki Mackenzie Dark Sky Reserve is. It's down to the southwest of Christchurch, where my son lives, or nearby, and it's got two lovely lakes, Lake Tekapako, and there's the other lake there, which goes up to Mount Cook. It's a beautiful part of New Zealand, but also very, very dark, which is why it's great to go there. This is a picture of Lake Tekapo, not mine, I'm afraid. It's a lovely image. Uh, the, the Milky Way wasn't doing that when I was there in February. Over on the top left there, you can actually make out the large Magellanic Cloud. These centres, the towns in this part of New Zealand, are becoming quite uh, famous for astro tourism really. Uh, this is a picture I actually took in February last year and I've blown up the saddle that you can see over to the left of the image over here and you might just make out one, two little white domes and they're the domes of the Mount John Observatory which is the largest optical observatory in New Zealand. As I said this area has become well known for astrotourism. A rather nice thing I haven't done is that there are some hot springs not far away and people will take you out there in the evening and you can relax on liners on the hot water and look up the stars. That must be rather nice. Um, to actually look at wide field views of the Milky Way, you can actually buy quite an interesting pair of binoculars. They're actually opera glasses and uh, they have an interesting sort of um, optical specification. Uh, the front objective is very big because it actually determines the field of view. But if you can get your eye quite close up to the back of the binoculars, the field of view is about 27 degrees across and you can actually take in the whole of the plow at one time. And it's a lovely thing for sweeping along the Milky Way. They're about 150 pounds, something like that. So, uh, I showed you the setup I had in Kerry, but to be honest, that's too heavy for me to take to New Zealand. I only want to have anything that's valuable, like my laptop, which is a small one I take with me, camera and uh, tracker, to be able to go in my online carry-on, on, on, on uh, the carry-on. So my tripod goes into the um, hold luggage, the rest that I carry with me. And at the time, when I was first going, about the smallest cameras, with interchangeable lenses were the Panasonic and Olympus Micro Four Thirds. And I bought one of those, and also an exceedingly good 20 millimeter prime lens. And this is the setup. The camera and lens is mounted on what's called a nano tracker, which is about the smallest tracker that you could buy then. There are a couple more now. It's rather nice because the control unit also contains the three AA batteries that drive it. So it's a very neat thing to have. You obviously can't carry particularly heavy cameras and lenses, but for the ones I've been taking to New Zealand, it's absolutely perfect. And four years ago, I made my first image of the galactic center from Mount John Observatory, and there it is. It's upside down, and it's very hard to make out particular things there, but I put um, some little things on to help. Um, you've obviously got Scorpius over on the lower left there, uh, Sagittarius, the teapot, up on the right, and above that a little circle of stars which is called Corona Australis, the Southern Crown. And I've highlighted two rather nice open clusters, M7 and M6. In fact, the way to find M7 is to imagine tea coming out of the teapot and it would fall in an arc through M7. In 2018, I actually bought a rather larger framed sensor camera, the APS-C sensor, the Sony Alpha 5000. One great thing about it is it has this tilting screen, which means that if you're trying to image high up in the 
sky, you haven't got to lie down on the ground and look up at the base of the camera, which I used to have to do with that little Panasonic camera. So that's very good. Um, so it's a nice little camera. They're not that expensive secondhand and one I recommend if you can get them. As I've been recommending them for some years now, a couple of years, they're rather hard to come by. Anyway, here it is mounted on my nano tracker. Um, two things. First of all, I made a little bracket. And what you can do is to fit in there one of these flexible, before it gets frozen, uh, ice packs. And that helps to keep the sensor cool and that reduces the noise. And secondly, the great thing about these mirrorless cameras is that with adapters, you can use legacy lenses as well as obviously lenses designed specifically for it. And uh, you'll see later, I've been using uh, quite an old, but very, very good Zeiss lens with that camera. And this is one that I bought specifically for it. A lot of astrophotographers are using it. With a 12 millimeter focal length on an APS-C camera, it's equivalent to 18 millimeters, which is in fact pretty wide. And uh, I've used that to observe the galactic center from Lincoln, where my son lives, south of Christchurch. Now, when we first went to his house there, there were no houses nearby. He looked out into the countryside. But sadly, since then, a big estate has been built. Um, this was obviously taken before it was dark, but I think you can see the street lights, which are not shielded. So the light pollution is not nearly as good in terms of what it was when I went there the first time. But nevertheless, last year, I had another go with that Samyang lens of taking a very wide image, field with image of the galactic center. And that red object up near the top, or reddish object, that's Antares. Red giants only look orange, uh, but there are two interlopers. The brightest object in here, it's not a star, that's Jupiter. Now it's very low down for us at the moment, but of course in the Southern Hemisphere, it's very high up. And further down, down here, is Saturn, on more as either side, of the center of the Milky Way. And there I've just zoomed in a bit just to show you Antares and part of Scorpius along with Sagittarius. And you can see, I think the two clusters quite nicely, M6 and M7 down here. So let's have a look at some of these Southern constellations. Now I know Sagittarius can be seen from up here, but for me, and I suspect from you in Nottingham, it really is pretty low down. I've only really seen it well when I've been at a star party on the very south coast in the Isle of Wight uh, and also in Dorset. But for here, I haven't got a very good southern horizon. So let's have a look at Sagittarius. Well, two lovely things there are the Triffid and the Goon Nebula. And we'll zoom in a bit to those. Um, there they are. Now, there are two colors visible, basically. The red, that's H alpha emission. Essentially, the very hot, bright stars at the heart of these two nebulae give out ultraviolet light, which excites the hydrogen, which then glows this lovely deep red color. You also see to the left of the Triffid Nebula, some blue color, and that's called a reflection nebula, as we see actually surrounding the Pleiades cluster in the Northern Hemisphere. And that's where dust is scattering and reflecting light from the blue stars. Looking in rather closer to the Triffid Nebula, it's, you can see why it's called Triffid because of those three dark lanes. And notice up on the top right what looks a bit like a unicorn up here. And um, there's the Hubble Space Telescope image. I think it's probably the other way up, but that doesn't matter. That was taken with its earliest wide field camera, which uh, had uh, parts missing. Um, it had that central part at high resolution, and the other three sections were at low resolution. So it could do a few things, but gave rather interesting images bit like a stealth fighter. And then M8, the Lagoon Nebula, is also a lovely region in Sagittarius. You can see the stars in the clusters. It's those bright blue stars, not that they show there, but are exciting the gas around it. Another rather nice nebula down there is called the Swan or Omega Nebula. And I've only really seen that once, and, and that was when I was in Hawaii, which was a lovely thing to see with a colleague's telescope in this front lawn down there. You can see perhaps why it looks a bit like a swan. Now Scorpius next door, and there is a little map showing Scorpius, and you can see on it um, we've got the two clusters M6 and M7 
done here. So we'll look at those first. There's M6, looks rather nice. Lots of new blue nebulosity. I suppose that's real, not, not an artifact of the photography, not mine. And here's M7, and you can see that's a very, very dense part of the Milky Way. So I hate to think how many stars are actually inside that particular image, but it'll be an awful lot. And also, we have a rather nice little region. It's where the, the arc of the tail uh, turns round, where we have the northern jewel box, which is this little region down here. But in fact, if you observe this region just with your eyes, it looks, obviously you don't get the resolution, it looks a bit like a comet. So it's called the fourth comet. And there is a picture of the jewel box, rather lovely one. And it's a, it's a nice area to look at. And you can obviously can see that from our Northern Hemisphere climbs. Another object in uh, Scorpius, which is rather nice, there are two good globular clusters, one of which is M80, the arrow. It's very close to Ophiuchus. And I often think, you know, the sun spends more time in Ophiuchus than it does in Scorpius. But would you want to be called an Ophiuchan? I rather doubt it. Anyway, I said it's very close to Ophiuchus, and there's a lovely cloud complex called the Rho Ophiuchi Cloud Complex complex nearby, and an M80 is in fact up on the top right, just there. So if we look into that, we get a lovely view of it. There are something like about three or four hundred thousand stars making up a globular cluster like this one. And they date back, we think, from the origin of our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. So they're really pretty old, and there doesn't tend to be any star formation happening in them at the present time. I've said that for a reason we'll come to. Well, a very interesting thing, of course, in our own galaxy, the heart is a supermassive black hole called Sagittarius A star. Um, Chandra can see it in the X-rays. We can't see it visually, but you can also see it in the infrared. And this is from the Very Large Telescope. Uh, which is actually four eight-meter telescopes in Chile. And uh, this is a view of one of them. And what has been able to be done recently, and I'm sure many of you know this, is to do something called adaptive optics. If there was a bright star in the same field as the object you're trying to image, you know that should be a point source. So computers can analyze the image that comes and then control little actuators on the back of a tertiary mirror, so it changes its shape to compensate for the fluctuations in the atmosphere. It's absolutely miraculous. And Keck has done some infrared images of the center of our Milky Way using this technique. And here is an infrared picture. It's actually easier to do in the infrared. The wavelength is longer, which helps. Actually, the atmosphere is also a lot calmer. And some of my best imaging of the moon I've done is in the infrared, and I've managed to get a resolution of about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 of an arc second using every trick in the book, largely developed by the Hubble Space Telescope Institute. But here you can see that field is less than one arc second across, but those stars are only about 64 milli arc seconds. So you can really see detail. And what has been done over the last quite a long time now is that they've actually plotted the positions of those stars over the time you see on the left. And we'll just let that run once more. Notice SO2, and actually S15, I think it is. SO2 does a complete orbit. There they are. And SO16 comes in from a very long way. And as it does so, it speeds up. So SO2 orbits with a period of just 15.78 years. SO16, the one that came from a long way away, is actually moving as it rounds this object at about 12,000 kilometers per second. I suspect that's the fastest moving object we know of in our Milky Way. If you take the motion of those stars, we get a best fit of what we assume, of course, is a, a, a massive black hole of 4.1 million solar masses. So not as big as some, but not bad. Um, while I was in uh, Lincoln, near Christchurch, I actually took 
a, a panorama, you've seen part of that before, but this includes another section of Milky Way, which I find very interesting indeed. Uh, it includes the constellations of Centaurus, Crooks or Crucus, um, Vela, and we'll see another one as well. So let's home into that area. We'll start with Centaurus. Well, here's a picture I took some little while ago. On the left, you can see Alpha Centauri. Then there's Beta Centauri. If you turn 45 degrees to the left and follow up this way, you come to a rather bright, fuzzy object. And as we'll see in a minute, that's called Omega Centauri. And we'll come to that shortly. They then act as what are called the pointers. And they point to Crucus or Crux, the Southern Cross. That star isn't really very bright, but it does make a cross. In fact, a lot of people think they've seen the Southern Cross when they see this set of stars down here in Vela and Carina, and that's actually called the False Cross. This is the real one. And down here is what is called the Coal Sack, one of the darkest dust regions or dust clouds in the Milky Way. Well, Alpha and Beta Centauri, let's look at those a bit. The Alpha Centauri system is actually uh, a double star. You can see them relative to our sun. And I'm sure you're aware that there's also an outline member, we believe, called Proxima Centauri, which is the nearest star 4.2 light years away from our own solar system. As I said, looking up to the left, we can come to Omega Centauri. Now, that's always been said for a very long time to be the largest and brightest and best globular cluster in our Milky Way galaxy. I am not now convinced that that is true. A lot of people now suspect it is the core of a galaxy that was actually stripped of its outer stars. And there are a couple of things that make us think that, or strongest think that, not just me, that A, there are quite a lot of younger stars in it that you wouldn't expect to find in a globular cluster. And also, there's evidence of a 40,000 solar mass black hole at its heart. They've tracked the movements of stars in that little box region down there, and they are moving very quickly. And the best explanation is that there is, in fact, a massive black hole that they're orbiting around. Another object in Centaurus, very interesting one, is called Centaurus A. It is the merger of an elliptical galaxy and a spiral galaxy, and that has caused a major eruption, really, at the center. It's called an active galaxy. And that's a more close-up image. And here's another one taken from the very large telescope, the four eight-meter telescopes in Chile. And you can see what's been going on at the heart. Um, the Chandra X-ray Observatory has imaged it and shows this jet coming out. And that's usually evidence as we find in many cases of a supermassive black hole at the heart. There's a 30,000 light year long jet. That's quite impressive. And that's what we think is happening. A black hole at the heart. Material is in fact in falling towards it, but going around in what's called the accretion disk. As it goes around faster and faster and faster, as it gets nearer the black hole, you get friction. And that can bring the temperature up to basically a couple of million degrees or perhaps more, and that gives off vast amounts of X-ray emission. But again, of course, we can see the jet. And here's a lovely composite image of both X-ray at the top, radio, middle right, and optical all put together. So it's a wonderful object, and it's just so sad it's something we can't observe from our Joggle Bank Observatory. It's a real pity. Um, okay, not quite on, on, on track, um, really, but this is something I wanted to mention. It's a wonder of the Southern Hemisphere, if not the Southern Hemisphere skies. And it's going to be called the European Extremely Large Telescope, EELT. It was originally called OWL, the Overwhelmingly Large Telescope, perhaps with a, a mirror getting on for 100 meters across. They decided they couldn't make it. It had to be de-scoped. It's now just the Extremely Large Telescope, but its mirror is still 39 meters across. And that is pretty impressive. It is built on the top of a mountain, not far from the very large telescope that I showed you just now. And of course, top mountain tops tend to be rather pointy. 
and so they had to blow the top off. That must have been quite impressive. So that is how it looked a while ago. There's the flat top, and the Chileans, in fact, build the structures, the rows, to bring everything to the top. And for that, they actually get time on the telescope. So it's quite a good deal, I think, for the Chileans. That is how it looks pretty much about now. They're putting in the dome foundations. Now, this won't be um, operational perhaps until 2026, something like that. But my goodness, that's going to make some wonderful observations. And I can't wait and uh, hopefully be around to see what it can find out. OK, um, I went back to Lake Tekapo last year and I used that Sony camera, as you saw, but this time with a legacy Zeiss 40 millimeter lens, quite old, but one of the best lenses of its era. And this, in fact, is a composite of three frames taken with that Zeiss lens. It doesn't look much different from the one I took um, earlier with the 20 millimeter. But on the other hand, this is quite compressed and the resolution is, in fact, quite a bit better. The Southern Cross and the Coal Sack, some of you can see just to the lower left of this star in the cross here is called the Southern Jewel Box. I hope I've got that right. And there's something we can do. Um, you can measure the distances of stars if they're not too far away by using parallax. You measure the position of the star, of a star, relative to the background stars, basically six months apart. And then you can measure the angle. And knowing that you've actually moved to AU during that period, you can actually compute the distance. And here's quite a nice little three dimensional plot of the stars Alpha and Beta Centaurus and Crookes. We'll start with Alpha and Beta Centaurus. You can see that Alpha Centaurus is just over four light years away, but Beta Centaurus is now thought to be about 400 light years away. Now it's not as bright as Alpha Centaurus, but it must be very, very much brighter to be visible so brightly at that distance. And in fact, we think it's about 42,000 times more luminous than our sun. If we now look at um, Crookes, Crookes, we see that three of its stars are quite close together in distance. One is quite separate. It's thought that those three, Alpha, Beta, and Delta Crookes, are part of an association of hot blue-white stars that share a common origin. They're all moving roughly in the same direction through the Milky Way. And the jewel box here, John Herschel called it a gorgeous piece of fancy jewelry. Um, this is my picture. OK, it's not brilliant, but you can just see that the jewel box is slightly resolved. There are two brighter stars, top right and top left. And if we zoom in a bit, there they are. And there's also a nice little uh, red giant star in the center. Isn't that a lovely little region of space? I can see why Herschel uh, said what he said about it. And that's just another picture obviously taken with a, well, it's either been done uh, post-processing to put the spikes in or with a Newtonian telescope. I, I wouldn't like to say which. Okay, uh, the coal sack I've mentioned before, it's just a very deep region uh, or dust cloud that obscures quite a bit of Milky Way that's behind and uh, is a nice thing to actually uh, to see. And there's another close-up picture adjacent to the Southern Cross. Now, there was a, a large constellation quite close by called Argo Navis. And if you think about Jason, the Argonaut, Argo is a ship. But it was decided to split it into two. And the top half they called Vela, which comes from sails, and the bottom half called Carina, from the keel, the Latin for keel, I think. And you've heard the word careening, where you tend to put a boat on its side to sort of clean the bottom. So here they are. Arena has got a very bright star called Canopus, we're going to come to in just a minute. Over on the left of Carina is uh, the Carina Nebula, again, which we'll talk about. Nothing that obvious in Vela, but it has actually some interesting things. One of them in Vela is called the Egg Burst Planet Nebula. It's a Hubble image, it's a lovely picture, isn't it? Um, not unlike the Ring Nebula we can see up in our northern climes. Um, the object in the center, as I'm sure you know, is called a white dwarf. Um, if you think about it, this is obviously politically incorrect. And I'm told the name is going to change. Neutral colored, dimensionally challenged object. So 
So uh, that may happen. Right, it also has a rather nice supernova remnant. Um, we have one uh, we have in Cygnus, don't we? And this is a little bit similar, these little wisps of uh, nebulosity you see. Um, the remnant of a supernova is called a, a neutron star in general. Uh, it's about the size of a city like Manchester, and these things spin round. They have a very powerful magnetic field, so beams of usually radio, but sometimes light, sweep around the sky, a bit like a, a lighthouse. And there you see one of these things rotating. Now, of course, every time the beam points at us, if it does, only about a third of them will do that, we get a little pulse of energy. So we call these things pulsars, as I'm sure you know. Um, the top left picture here, I think, is an X-ray sequence of images showing you the pulsations in X-rays. And you can see on the right there the shock waves that are coming out from the pulsar itself. And if this works, and I click on this, we'll hear what the radio pulses sound like. Obviously, no sound comes from these objects. But what happens is if we take the radio signal, which has little pulses, and we apply it to a loudspeaker cone, then the cone goes back and forth very rapidly and we get little clicks. And this one at 11 cycles per second sounds rather lovely. That's to wake anybody up if they've fallen asleep. So let's have a look at Carina. Over to the lower right is the second brightest star in the heavens, actually called Canopus. And I'll come to that in just a minute. You'll see over to the red, uh, over to the left, that rather nice little reddish region that's called the Carina Nebula, which we'll also talk about. Now there you can see Sirius and Canopus. As I said, it's the second brightest star in the sky. But in fact, it's a lot, lot further away and very much brighter. Um, some of you will know about um, the Hertz von Russell diagram, where you plot stars from right to left in terms of color and from bottom to top in terms of brightness. And our sun is used to be one. You have stars up to a million times brighter. This is a more complex diagram, but it does show the sun, Sirius, and Canopus. And you can see how bright Canopus really is. And that's interesting, as we shall see. Now, our sun has a main sequence lifetime of about 8,000 million years. It's about 4,000 million years old, so I wouldn't let that worry you too much. However, Canopus is 13,600 times more luminous than our sun. So I hope you can see it must be burning up its fuel far more rapidly. But its mass is only 8.5 times that of the sun, so with a quick sum, you can expect it will only last in five around five to six million years. That's quite interesting. Well, this is again my picture, not very good, but you've got the Carina Nebula, the reddish region, below which is the Southern Pleiades. I don't think they're quite as impressive as our Northern ones, to be honest. You can see them with binoculars, but they're nothing like as exciting. But there's a nice picture of them. As we see there, you can see that it's in quite a dense region of the Milky Way. And then above that, we have the Carina Nebula and it's slightly triffid with those dark clouds as well. And the brightest region is around here, which we're gonna zoom into. And that was, these are the two dark lanes, and this is this white region. And in there is a star called Eta Carina. Now, it was always about fourth magnitude. But in 1837, it brightened to magnitude zero, and then was in fact the seventh brightest star in the heavens. But by 1856, it had faded to below an LED eye visibility. However, since 1949, it's actually brightening again and is now about magnitude 4.5. And that's actually the light curve. Why is that happening? Well, we think there was a major outburst in the 1800s. And that produced a great shell of dust that basically obscured the light. And I think something similar happened with Betelgeuse. Do you remember around Christmas time, we all got excited because Bet Betelgeuse dropped in brightness by about one and a half magnitudes. It's going up again now. And I think there's a lot of evidence now. It was a similar thing that a, a, a cloud of dust was erupted or material which obscured the light for some time. So that's what we think happened here. What is left now, and the reason you can actually see it, 
is that the gas clouds have actually got larger and they form what's called a homunculus nebula. And this is a lovely Hubble image of it. And right at the heart there, you can actually just see the star Eta Carina. Now, it is probably the next star in our heavens that's going to become a supernova. Now, a typical one at the distance of Eta Carina would basically get to around magnitude minus four, which is similar to Venus. And I hope you've all had a lovely view of Venus in the last month or so. However, it's thought this could be perhaps what we might call a hypernova, four magnitude brighter. And that could potentially be the brightest supernova in recorded history. And the sad thing, of course, is if it does happen in our lifetimes, we won't see it here. Anyway, we shouldn't worry about it too much. It's 7,500 light years away, so it shouldn't directly affect us, as things like the gamma rays will be protected and absorbed in the atmosphere and cosmic rays in the magnetosphere. So hopefully we'll be okay. Okay, the Magellanic clouds, they're two lovely things you see in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, they do look like little clouds, actually. You've got to know roughly where to look because they're not very bright. But in fact, the large Magellanic cloud is actually quite large. Um, that sadly is not my picture. I have got a couple of mine coming up later. They are members of our local group of galaxies. In fact, the LMC is the fourth largest in our local group. Now, there's some arguments. It's been widely thought that they're orbiting our galaxy. Some people think they might be passing by, but I don't think we'll know that for quite some time. The small magnetic cloud has a rather lovely globular cluster, 47 Takani, just to its left. And if we discount Omega Centauri, that might be the biggest and brightest in the Southern Hemisphere. The small magnetic cloud had a major role to play in the discovery of the size of the universe and its age. There was a lovely lady called Henrietta Leavitt who joined Harvard Observatory. She was a computer. They were the ladies who carried out the astronomical computations, and they were called computers, which is where the name of the thing I'm using and you're using comes from. She discovered lots of variable stars, but then she observed stars called Cepheid variables. In fact, the first one was discovered by John Goodrick. It's just over to the left of Deneb in Cygnus in the constellation of Cepheus. And these are stars that vary in brightness. They're very slow astronomical clocks. And she observed quite a number of them in the small Magellanic cloud. Now, I think you can see from that diagram that all the stars in the Magellanic cloud are roughly the same distance from the sun. So if a star appears to be brighter in the LMC, it will be, and conversely, is also true. And what she discovered was that the brightness of these Cepheid variables depended on their period. The variable stars, the Cepheids with the longest periods had the brightest luminosity compared to our sun. And I think you can see, and this is quite critical, that one with a period of 30 days is about 10,000 times brighter than our sun. Well, you've all heard of Edwin Hubble, and he used the 100-inch Hooker telescope at Mount Wilson to observe the Andromeda galaxy hoping to find a Cepheid variable, so he could then calculate its distance. And on the 6th of October, 1923, he found one. This is perhaps one of the most significant photographs of the last century in astronomical terms. He found it had a period of 31 days. From that, he could calculate or estimate the, the brightness, and that showed that M31 lay far beyond our Milky Way galaxy. He went on to use these to measure distances of 25 galaxies whose recession velocities had been measured by Vesto Stryfer at the Lowell Observatory. That enabled him to make what's called the Hubble plot, distance along the bottom and recession velocity up on the right and left. This showed a linear relationship between distance and recession velocity, and that implies our universe is expanding. From the rate of that expansion, you can calculate how old the universe is. As I said, to the left of the 
small magnetic cloud is a very nice cluster called 47 Takami, very pretty. There are lots of pulsars in there spinning very rapidly as they've been spun up. They're called millisecond pulsars. And there's a nice view of it. A very dense core right at the center, I think you can see that. Well, I did aim to try to photograph the LMC with my Zeiss lens. I'm not too unhappy with that, actually. It does show that reddish region there called the Tarantula Nebula, and at its heart, that little bright region, is a star cluster called 30 Doradus. And here's a much better picture, showing the bar, it sometimes thought to be, in fact, a spiral galaxy, um, with two arms coming off at either end of that bar there. Anyway, there you can see the Tarantula Nebula. It's obviously very bright there. And that's a rather better picture. Now, one interesting thing about this is this is probably the largest region of star formation that we can observe nearby. And so you tend to get stars being born quite often. And some of those, of course, will eventually become supernovae. So every night, telescopes in New Zealand, Australia, and Chile will take pictures of the LMC, hoping to capture a supernova. And in 1987 in February, they did. The story of its discovery is quite interesting. It's normally discovered by a, a Canadian called Ian Shelton, who was using a telescope in Chile. However, somewhat earlier in time, in Australia, an astronomer called Robert McNaught had also photographed it. But rather than process the plate before he went home to bed, he went home to bed to process it the next morning, by which time Ian Shelton had processed his picture and there was the supernova. One nice thing though, that although he didn't actually nominally discover it, he did discover a very nice comet, we call it Comet McNaught. It didn't really show up very well in the Northern Hemisphere, but it was beautifully seen in the Southern Hemisphere. Another very interesting thing about that supernova. Some quite some time ago, physicists, theoretical physicists, had had a theory that maybe protons would decay on a time scale with a half-life of let's say a billion years, which would mean that in the long term the universe would just disappear. Well, you obviously could look at one proton per billion years and after that time, there was a 50% chance of having disappeared. You can't do that. What you can do is to look at a billion protons, which you get in water, of course, per year. And so they built these detectors, nominally to detect the decay of protons. However, they can also detect neutrinos. And in fact, they detected a burst of neutrinos that arrived three hours before it's thought the light arrived. And there is a the little spike there. In fact, from where the Cherenkov photons impinge on the photoelectric detectors, you can actually get an idea of where the neutrinos came from. And it pointed back to the large magnetic cloud. Now, how could they arrive three hours earlier? Well, what in fact happened is that the neutrinos left the center of that supernova instantly but the light didn't leave until some time later as the shock wave reached the surface. So that explains it. Neutrinos don't travel faster than light. Now, if a neutrino travels through a liquid, it can cause uh, a Cherenkov photon to be produced. It's thought that um, at least two people on the Earth might have seen a flash of light in their eyes when a neutrino actually involved and collided with one of our protons. There's a Hubble Space Telescope image up on the right there. It shows that ring, which was actually formed by a shell of gas that was emitted from the supernova star some time earlier. Now, these are a sequence of HST images. Just watch what happens. At some point, it lights up. I'll just let you see that once more. There we are. Now, why was this interesting? That's a lovely picture of it there. 
Well, that picture was taken about 232 days after the explosion of the supernova. So it took ultraviolet light that time to reach that ring of material. So you know the radius in light days. That Hubble Space Telescope image shows us that the radius of the ring is 0.86 arc seconds. A little bit of trigonometry, you actually get quite an accurate value of the distance of the large magnetic cloud, and in particular, of course, the tarantula nebula. So that paints right nice. So the very end. Finally, I stayed in Lake Tekapo, as I said, and I used two lenses, one in the evening and one later at night from the same location on the shore of Lake Tekapo. If some of you have been there, you'll know there's a rather lovely little church, chapel really, called the Church of the Good Shepherd. It looks out through a lovely window over the lake, but you're not allowed to take photographs inside. But I went down there fairly late in the evening before it was quite dark, and I took a picture of that little church. And then as it got dark nearby, I took a much longer image of the sky with that Samyang wide angle lens. There is that wide angle image. And I maybe didn't get it quite right when I tried to take it because I obviously didn't get the Milky Way in the center, but pleasingly, I got the large magnetic cloud over to the side there. So what I did then is I took that picture and I took my picture of the Church of the Good Shepherd and melded them together to form the final image of this little tour. One or two things just to say, I hope you like that. It's actually done quite well in our local astronomical society. I do produce a monthly sky guide for the Jodrell Bank website. It's called Night Sky. Well, Night Sky Jodrell will get it very easily. Um, there's usually an audio version in what's called the Jodcast, but it doesn't appear to have actually happened this month, even though I recorded my bit about the night sky um, at home instead of doing it at the university. So maybe they'll start happening again. I hope they will. So that's one thing. Um, I also have been spending quite a bit of time in the last couple of years writing, really it's a blog, I don't really like the word blog, so I call it an astronomy digest. So if you search for that, it comes up top, or it's www.ianmorrison.com, I'm sorry, not .net, .com. And notice there's only one R there, which is most unusual. Uh, I come from a, a family from um, the Isle of Lewis, and we've never added the extra R that a group of grocers did at the end of the 1800s. I got quite worried, in fact, last year when I discovered where Donald Trump's mother came from. She actually came from the village of Tongue in the Isle of Lewis, four miles from where my family comes from. I just hope there wasn't too much interbreeding in the past. So there we go, a couple of things to look at. In the digest, um, it does actually tell you about three books I've written in the last few years. Uh, the most recent one is called The Art of Astrophotography, and it tries to explain how to do it. And I'm currently trying to write an ebook on doing astrophotography with a DSLR or mirrorless camera. Anyway, I hope you found some of it interesting. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for your talk. Brilliant talk. That's, I think that's the sixth or seventh that you've given now to uh, Nottingham Astronomical Society. And we always really appreciate your. Uh, involvement in the society and coming to give us a talk I think every year for about the last five or six years. Um, so please do submit your questions now to uh, Ian using the YouTube uh, live chat facility um, and those will appear on the screen. Um, so, I'm unmuted but you've not allowing me to put my video on. Okay just, there we go that should ah. allow you to turn your video on now so we can see you. Yes we're there the very good. Thank you. We can see you in the corner of the screen now. Um, That's enough. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll start with a quick question from myself, if, if possible. Of course. Well, in, I've never actually been to the Southern Sky, so I found the talk really interesting to learn lots about the, the Southern Hemisphere sky that I've never even seen. So it's definitely one I'd like to go and have a look at at some time. But obviously you're involved quite heavily with the uh, Jodrell Bank and the Lovell Telescope. If you could move the Lovell Telescope into the Southern Hemisphere, where... Well, what would you actually look at? What would be the first thing you'd point at if you could move its location? Oh, that's a good question. Well, the Tarantula Nebula has got a fantastic number 
of these highly rapidly rotating neutron stars. And uh, we do have to use our colleagues at the um, big dish, the dish at the Parkes Telescope in New South Wales to observe it. Um, we've actually built a lot of hardware um, which goes on their telescope to observe uh, these neutron stars or pulsars. So we do a lot of collaborative work, but we'd love to do it. We'd love to be able to be down there. You, you see the Milky Way so much better, and that's where most of these pulsars are. The Lovell Telescope, not very good for finding pulsars, but it's a superb instrument for measuring the changes in their frequency and so on. That's one thing. Uh, we would obviously would have loved to have been around when the supernova happened uh, and could have observed that. And maybe there'll be another one before too long. Um, and the other thing, of course, is that when this lovely EELT comes on stream, there may be some things that we should try and look at in collaboration with that. So a lot of lovely things. But nevertheless, there are some nice things for us to see in the Northern Hemisphere. So we're quite happy to be here. OK, uh, quick question. I don't know if you can see the questions on the screen there. There's one from, from Julian. Um, says, I believe the most massive star known is the, I don't know if it's pronounced that as Tarantula Nebula. Is that so? Tarantula, yes. Tarantula, oh, is it? Sorry. It's all right. Um, I don't, I, it could well be true. I, I actually think that the, what the, the one Eta Carina um, is probably, it may be a double star, is probably one of the largest. And I can't argue that there isn't a, a larger one in the Tarantula Nebula. I'm not sure, but uh, they're pretty impressive. Okay, I'm um, looking down here. Um, what's my favorite southern object? Oh boy, that's an interesting thing. Um, I think probably the Southern Cross region. I, I love that part of the Milky Way, uh, more so I think than the, the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Um, so let's say Crooks, the Southern Cross. I think that's nice. Um, um, the supernova that caused the two outer rings, uh, are they shell of gas being illuminated by two jets? No, I don't think so. They're not being illuminated by two jets. They, they've been illuminated by ultraviolet light coming from the star that basically, well, in, in the, the big one, the bright one, was when the actual supernova happened and that caused a great pulse of ultraviolet light which when it got there lit them up so i don't think it's anything to do with a pulse star um oh you somebody liked the one of the church of the night sky well thank you very much for that um that's good of you uh, oh by the way i hope nobody fell asleep i didn't and i was the one that was most likely to so that was something a quick question about the um, the large and the small Magellanic Clouds. You said that they're unrelated to the Milky Way. We probably think they're passing by. Are the actual large and the small Magellanic Clouds related to each other? Um, oh, wow. I mean, they're not that far apart from each other. So they were probably formed about the same time in the same basic gas cloud, large gas cloud, I would have thought. Um, I mean, they could well be still going around um, our Milky Way, but it, the, the trajectory is perhaps not quite right for that. We, we shall, it takes a long time to find out these things, but that's something I just happen to have come across. It may or may not be true. Um, but I must admit that they are lovely things to see. Uh, the first time I tried to image the LMC, I had to go, we were actually staying in a, in, in a bit of a forest and my wife and I had a lovely room up in the treetops with, with, with no roof. I mean, it was a clear uh, roof so we could just lie under the stars and look up. But the only where, where I could actually see the LMC was from the drive of a house that was empty, not far away. So I went in the drive and nearly got run over by the car as it came home on the way back. Um, but they're, they're very pretty things to look at, actually. So you do need to know where to look. And the great thing, of course, is that with things like um, Solarium or um, I've got uh, Sky Safari, it's very easy to see what's where, which is lovely. Um, and of course, I still take down a, a, a little planisphere with me. The old things is a planisphere for the Southern Hemisphere. And uh, that's certainly very useful for learning the sky. There's a real problem when it's very, very dark. And I'm sure some of you have noticed this, that stars, there's so many stars, it's very hard to make out the constellations. And 
this was most obvious to me when I was happily down in uh, South Africa, but I spent a few days in Cape Town where there was some light pollution and I was able to learn the sky based upon that little planetarium, uh, sorry, planisphere. We then went up to Sutherland, which is where they have their big optical telescopes, about 6,000 feet up. That, in fact, is the clearest and best sky I've ever seen in my life. And I just never went to bed. I spent the whole night just looking up at the stars and watching Omega Centauri rise uh, from the east towards the north, of course, as these things do down there, it's all back to front. And um, because I'd actually learnt the sky a bit, I was able to show some of the professional astronomers we were able to use a two meter telescope for a while where we were actually looking. And that's the trouble we see with professional uh, astronomers. They, we just put the coordinates in on our computers and never look at the sky. And I'm a very odd person because since I retired, uh, I've been, someone actually said to me, I'm now a professional amateur astronomer. And I, I quite like that. I'll shut up. Anybody else? I've, I had to put my glasses on to read, I'm afraid. Um, has Hubble. I, I'm not convinced that Hubble's particularly looked at, but it might have done. I, I, I wish I'd, I don't know is the answer. I do apologize, but certainly for something like, um, get this right, three or four weeks, I was trying to photograph uh, Betelgeuse and Bellatrix to compare the two um, and, and, and just watch what was happening. And it's totally good that it's now brightening back up again. I don't think it's going to blow up anytime soon. We had hoped it might do. Um, somebody says, are you a mirrorless convert? Um, now, oh, yes, I am. Yes, uh, that's the type of camera. Uh, and the main reason is that because the distance from the flange to the sensor is so much less than with the DSLR, with adapters, of which I've got about five or six, you can fit lenses from the past from almost any camera system you like. So on my mirrorless cameras, I can fit my Nikon lenses because I have a, a Nikon system from a long time ago. Um, I've got three Zeiss lenses. I've got some Tamron. I mentioned one of the Tamrons and one or two others. So I can go from 24 millimeters to a thousand. And the nice thing is that if you want to image something, wide field imaging, you can choose the appropriate uh, lens from that little range of lenses I've got to cover the field of view you want. And I'm afraid since buying that um, little APS-C one, I've actually bought two of the Sony full frame cameras. There's a A7S, there's only 12 megapixels, which is very low, but that makes it very sensitive. And you can actually take videos and show uh, meteors trails across the sky. So it's a bit specialized, but great fun. So yes, I do like mirrorless uh, cameras and I'm not really using my Nikon DSLRs, although I've got a very good one, the 610, very much now. Um, I'm just, yes, uh, the hands pepper. Yes, I mean, uh, James Hofton, I think it is, he says, having spent a lot of my time of his sea career in the Southern Hemisphere, there's nothing better to view on a clear and dark night than the Milky Way. And that's absolutely true. And I would just say that those funny binoculars uh, that are off glasses also uh, are pretty fantastic as well. You've got a, a lovely field of view. If your eyes, and you don't have to wear glasses with them, are right up, you don't really notice that you're looking through opera glasses or anything. It just seems as though your eyes have become vastly better than they were. Isn't that lovely? Yes, James Dawson is one of your favorite films, The Dish. I, keep, I should have mentioned that earlier. The Dish is a wonderful film. Um, I'm sure some of you of my age will remember when Nick, uh, Nixon spoke to Armstrong on the surface of the moon. And those signals were relayed by that Parks dish I mentioned in New South Wales, and its name is The Dish. And that film is actually a comedy. Uh, I'm sure you can get it for about a fiver off Amazon, and I would really recommend it. It's a lovely, lovely, lovely film. Um, to watch, uh, and uh, please do. Um, yes, yeah, seeing constellations upside down from some of them is surprising. Yes, it is, and of course, everything moves the wrong way. It takes a while to get used to what's happening to the sun and the moon when you're down there as well. I think we're almost there, but anybody else coming up? 
I think there was just one from Shirley a bit further up saying, asking what evidence was there for the thinking that the Magellanic clouds may be passing by our galaxy? It's just from their trajectory and how fast they're moving. Um, if they were bound to the Milky Way, their speed couldn't be greater than a certain amount. And uh, the, it seems that the actual velocity, it's really speed and direction that matters, is slightly higher than you might expect if, the, if they were bound to the Milky Way. So that's why people think that they're actually perhaps not part of our Milky Way. I'm getting very close to the screen, I'm sorry. Okay, very good. Um, oh, I thought he meant mirrorless telescopes. Uh, well, I, that's, if he did, uh, yes, I, I love refractors. Um, I've got them from 60 millimeters up to 150, actually. My bestest, if that's a word I can use, is made by CFF telescopes in Hungary and um, Romania, I think. And they are basically um, of similar quality to those most by, made by astrophysics. And happily, I got mine some years ago at just over 3,000 pounds. I think the equivalent scope now is much nearer six. Uh, and I love using that. Now, I, I, I hope some of you have seen the um, beautiful moon we've had in the clear skies in the last few nights. And I've been trying to encourage my buddies to image it using a Canon uh, DSLR uh, with a program called EOS Movie Record. And I I've done that with that uh, refractor in the last few nights, not obviously last night, but a couple of nights before. Uh, on my blog, the one you saw called Astronomy Digest, I I've written up an article about doing that and that will go up tomorrow or Sunday or, my, or Saturday. So that will be there quite soon. And it's quite good. Just having a Canon DSLR, you can actually use it as a webcam and do what they call lucky imaging to get higher resolution images. Ah, OK, no cameras, but he, he likes the answer to both. OK, right, <laughs> good. And, and we'll post a, a link to members via the email to your digest. So oh, thank we'll take you. Take a look at that. Uh, it, it's, Look, it's free, and there's about 75 articles in it now, and some of them might be of some interest. That's all I can say. Brilliant. I think that's most of the questions. So thanks ever so much for your time, Ian, uh, and for preparing the talk. My it's, pleasure. It's my nice pleasure. to see you inside your home and see your nice painting. I can see you behind you. At, at, uh, yes, that's at done by one of my colleagues, actually. There's only a minor problem. He hasn't put in some of the cross trucks on the tower over here. And he's obviously got the original, and I'm going to try and pay him to add a couple so I can actually buy the original. Um, but it's a lovely, the colours are beautiful, and um, it's a nice bit. The other thing, of course, I love, I don't know if you can see on the right hand, on the other side, that's the Darjeeling Railway. Nice. And I rather like uh, small railways. I've got my own steam railway engine that I can drive around the track, but of course, none of that can be done at the present time. Anyway, it's been great being with you all. Hope someday I can come and see you in person again. I've always enjoyed my trips to you. And keep safe. And I hope we get some more clear skies before long and you can actually have a look at the stars. Good to be with you. Brilliant, Ian. Thank you so much again for, for joining us. Um, before we close tonight, then just a quick reminder that our next online meeting uh, is on Thursday, the 18th of June, and that is at 8 p.m. And that's going to be the basics of astrophotography and we'll be joined by Lee and James to do that. So I hope you can join us on the 18th. Thanks again for watching. Apologies if one or two of you had problems at the very start of the meeting accessing the talk, but uh, we will have this on YouTube, so you'll be able to catch the very start if you missed that. Um, so until uh, next Thursday the 18th, I uh, hope you all have a very pleasant evening. Good night.